a big church then. I got to go get my Bible. All right. Well, I'm going to ask you to take your Bible this morning. We're glad to see you this morning. Take your Bible to John chapter 5, verse 16 through 23. I've been preaching verse by verse through the book of the gospel according to John. I'm just preaching on this subject this morning, the importance of the Son. The importance of the Son. I'm going to ask you if you're physically able, would you stand with me as we honor the reading of God's holy and perfect word? John chapter 5, verse 16 through 23. You follow along now, for this is the word of our great God. The gospel according to John chapter 5 verse 16 through 23. The Bible says, For this reason the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father has been working until now, and I have been working. Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he had not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the father do, for whatever he does the son also does in like manner. For the father loves the son and shows him all things that he himself does and he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel for as the father raises the dead and gives life to them even so the son gives life to whom he will for the father judges no one but has committed all judgment to the son that all should honor the son just as they honor the father he who does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him you may be seated as we pray together this morning. Father, would you add the blessings, the uh, reading of your word, the preaching of your word to ears today, to hearts today, to lives today. Lord, change people today by your power. Lord, I pray that we'd look to Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith. God, I pray you would save the lost in this place today. Lord, that you would set free the captives today. Lord, that you would raise up your workers and your servants today to honor you in all that we do. Lord, that we might point others to Jesus. Bless this time, Lord, around your word is our prayer, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. John chapter 5, verse 16 through 23. We're going to talk about that. The importance of the Son. Isaiah 40, verse 26 says, Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things, who brings out their host by number. He calls them by name. By the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, not one is missing. God knows the stars all by name. He knows our nearest star by name. He knows the Son. He made it all. So, in general, all of us know and understand the importance of the Son. Without the Son, we could not exist. Amen. Well, let me give you some facts about the sun. At the core, the sun is 27 million degrees Fahrenheit. It is immense, and the sun's output of energy is staggering. Uh, though it is 93 million miles away from the earth, the sun is the earth's main source of energy. Energy leaves the sun at the rate of 5 million tons per second. Day in and day out, week after week, month after month, year after year, the sun is giving out its energy. Christian scientists tell us that the sun gives off more energy in one second than mankind has produced since Adam and Eve. In one second, the sun provides its energy by nuclear fusion, converting hydrogen into helium on a grand scale. The sun heats the earth, and thus it drives all the weather systems and all the weather patterns on the entire earth. All the energy we have on earth is only one billionth of the amount of energy that comes from the sun. Uh, did you know this? Our earth's pretty big. I mean, you can travel, it takes me a lifetime not travel much of it. Our earth is big, but that it, uh, one million of our earths could fit in the circumference of the sun. One million! That's how big our sun is. I would say that the sun is very important. The sun has been placed in, in the atmosphere in such a way by our Lord uh, that the earth does not burn up and that the inhabitants of the earth do not freeze to death. Now some of you may think you're going to freeze to death, but you're not going to freeze to death. <laughs> and you're not going to burn up because God situated the sun in such a way. I would say that the sun is very important, but greater in importance than the sun that's in the sky is the Son of God that's on the throne. Amen. 
And we're going to talk about that in this passage we just read a few minutes ago. And John here declared the attack on Jesus, the activity of Jesus, the announcement by Jesus, and the authority of Jesus. We're going to look at all of that as we talk about the importance of the Son. The Lord Jesus is Lord, and He's to be listened to. He's to be obeyed. He's to be served and honored. He's to be adored and worshipped. I want to challenge all people today to prioritize the Lord Jesus in all things. What importance does Jesus have in your life? What importance? How important is His Word? How important is His Word? How important is His worship to you? This passage gives us some great truths about the importance of the Son. And I want to talk about that today. The importance of the Son. I want to point out, number one, if you follow along with me in your outline, you got an outline in your bullet and you want to follow along with me, number one, I want you to notice the persecution of Jesus. John, the Apostle John, teaches us about the persecution of Jesus in verses 16 through 18. He tells us, first of all, about the reason for the persecution. He says in verse 16, for this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus. Now, we've been preaching verse by verse, so let me give you a little recap. Jesus had... Uh, uh, on the Jewish festival, and it was on the Sabbath day, he came to the pool of Bethesda where there was many lame and sick and, and paralyzed laying out by the pool. And Jesus healed one man, told him to take, get up. This man had been sick and paralyzed for 38 years. And Jesus said, take, arise, take up your mat and walk. And John says in John chapter 5 verse 9, this was the Sabbath day. He did it on the Sabbath day. And that old boy didn't get too far carrying his mat before he, before he ran into these Jewish legalists, these religious leaders. And they rebuked him for carrying his mat on the Sabbath day. They asked him, who told you to do that? He didn't know Jesus at this time, but he would meet up with Jesus. We learned that last week. Jesus found him in the temple and he introduced himself to him, but he also warned him to go and sin no more. In verse 15, the Bible says that the man departed from Jesus and went and told the religious rulers that it was Jesus that made me well. And so the Bible says, John tells us in verse 16, for this reason... Jesus, the Jews began to persecute Jesus. By their, in their minds, Jesus was guilty of breaking the Sabbath day, of the breaking the commandment. Warren Wiersbe said the, Jews leader, the Jewish leaders did not prosecute the man who was healed even though he had broken the law. But they did begin to persecute the Lord Jesus. The, the word persecuted there means to pursue, to, to follow after, to subjugate, to suffer, to press forward on. And the word in the Greek language is in the perfect, imperfect tense. It describes a continuous action. From that time on, the persecution started and it did not let up. They began at that point and they kept it up. They didn't let up in the persecution of Jesus. They were convinced that Jesus was guilty of breaking the Sabbath day and this uh, did more than just uh, uh, displease them, but it angered them. It motivated them to want to kill Jesus. The Jewish leaders missed the point of the Sabbath day. And they were legalistic in their rules and the applications of the Sabbath day. Now, New Testament believers do not keep the Jewish Sabbath day. That was yesterday, the seventh day of the week. This is the first day of the week. We come together on the first day of the week. We worship the Lord on the first day of the week in remembrance of His resurrection and in recognition of His reign as Lord. Amen. Lewis Sperry Chafer wrote about the Lord's Day and how believers are to relate to Sunday. Listen to what he said. This is a good word. He said, the Lord's Day is not a day for selfish entertainment or amusement. It is not a day for idleness and rest. Its privileges should be and will be preserved by all who delight to do His will. It becomes an opportunity for many who are held by secular week work during the days of the week to offer the fullest service of prayer, worship, and testimony which belongs to their Lord. The instructed Christian no longer labors to be accepted of God, which was the obligation under the law, but he being accepted in grace labors to glorify his Lord who saves him. He has ceased from his own works and though ceaselessly active is working in the power and the energy of the Spirit. Well, because of the perceived Sabbath violation, the Jewish leaders began to persecute Jesus. John recalls when it all started in the intensity of the persecution and it it would increase and not lessen. And their hatred would grow hotter and not go away. At the end of verse 16, John tells us there, he, because he had done these things on the Sabbath day, the Lord Jesus did good on the Sabbath. The Lord Jesus showed mercy on the Sabbath. The Lord Jesus showed compassion on the Sabbath day. The Lord raised the sick man up. Therefore, the Jewish leaders sought to put the Savior down. 
There's the reason for their persecution. John also tells us about the resolve in their persecution. He said in verse 16, they sought to kill him. You see that? And sought to kill him. So the religious rulers' anger just didn't flare up for a moment and then dissipate. The rulers' anger drove them to want to kill Jesus. Wow. They hated Jesus all because he had supposedly broken their Sabbath law. He challenged their authorities what he did, and they were angry about it. R.C.H. Linsky in his commentary on John said, To these fanatical Jews, their own hatred, persecution, and murderous intentions were virtues. And, and the mercy, the miracles of Jesus, and his showing them as signs and seals of his son, divine sonship were mortal crimes. People do stupid things when they're driven by anger and, dri uh, and angered and driven by anger. They do stupid things. Listen, hatred blinds the eyes and hardens the heart. They hated Jesus. The religious leaders were convinced in their hearts and minds they were deceived and they were hard-hearted. To them, the Lord was deserving of death because he broke the Sabbath command and healed the man, had mercy on the man, set the man free on the Sabbath day. The preacher, they were legalists. Amen. They were legalists. They didn't understand the Lord and the compassion of the Lord. They didn't understand. I told you they were more concerned about the letter of the law than the spirit of the law. That man could have laid there paralyzed for the rest of his life as long as they, their perceived rules were not broken. I love Charles Swindoll gave a great illustration about legalism. Listen to this. He said, legalism is a silent killer. Like carbon monoxide, it is odorless, colorless, and tasteless. And it has the power to lull the mind into a deep sleep from which it will never emerge. So I never recommend a person remain in a place where the poison of legalism has displaced the fresh air of grace. One individual cannot rescue an organization permeated with legalism. He or she can only escape, leave the poison behind, and seek a place of grace. The Bible tells us about the reason for the persecution. The resolve, their resolve, they wanted to kill Jesus. Notice the response to the persecution. Jesus will respond to them. He, he gives a word about the Father's work here in verse 17. But Jesus answered them, My Father has been working until now, and I have been working. So the Lord responds to the hostility against him with insight about the Father's work. John Phillips said the underlying thought in the Lord's defense of his own behavior is that he had not described the Sabbath, excuse me, he has not des des desecrated the Sabbath, rather they had distorted the Sabbath. It was their beliefs, not his behavior, that were at fault. He called his Father to witness. On the seventh day, God rested from his creation work. The Bible tells us that. He, cre he rested from creation work, but he did not rest in his sustaining work, or in his providing for work, or in his sovereign rule work. God's always been at work. I mean, if God quit doing what God does, the whole world would implode and the whole universe. Uh, he holds it all together by the word of, the power of his word. <laughs> God's also at work in redemption. He's been working since the Garden of Eden. He's, uh, by the way, he, before then, but I'm just saying in, in the human terms, we've seen the fall of man. God's at work in redeeming. He's, uh, he's still seeking to save that which was lost. John MacArthur said, His words also serve as a subtle rebuke to the Jewish legalistic system under which he had been indicted for doing good and showing mercy on the Sabbath. After all, God himself does good and shows mercy on the Sabbath. Jesus therefore maintained that it is right to do good on the Sabbath since God does. Amen. God does good on the Sabbath. Church, let's do good on the Sabbath. Amen. <laughs> Jesus did not release us from keeping a day of rest and trusting Him and drawing near to Him. We, we have that today. And we don't keep the Jewish Sabbath. We don't go through the rituals that they went through. But He challenged us to keep it in the right way by setting down our work, consciously taking time for rest and understanding that God has a place in our work and our rest, which makes them both holy. When we keep our Lord's Day, uh, consider the following questions I put on the screen. You can write them down if you want to. I've got a place for you in your outline. Consider these questions as we keep the Lord's Day. Number one, when I work, am I working for God? If you're not doing that, you're not following Jesus. You're not obeying the Lord. You're, not, you're, not, you're doing it in the power of the flesh. Number two, when I rest, am I resting in God? Number three, does my resting refresh me for work? Number four, how does my time of rest include devotion to God? 
We need to be drawing near to God daily. By the time of rest, we, we don't just rest physically. We rest in Him and we're to draw near to Him. We are to be devoted to Him. It's a time of worship, a time of praise, a time of celebration, a time of coming closer to Jesus and, and God. We've noted the words about the Father's work. Notice the, the Jews' work against the Lord's word. Verse 18, they would respond, Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him. I mean, John gives us a revela revelation here about their determination. They were determined to kill all the more. Why did they do that? Well, the Apostle John spotlights here their determination. They sought to kill Jesus all the more. They got, the heat got turned up. <laughs> their determination got ramped up. And their hatred boiled over. They were determined to do all they could to kill Jesus. He was a threat to them, and they would wage war against him. Now, this was about a year and a half into the public earthly ministry of our Lord Jesus. That means for the next year and a half, uh, so the last half of our Lord's earthly ministry, uh, he would face intense, ongoing, increasing persecution from the religious leaders. It wouldn't dissipate. It was ongoing. It would, it would be more and more. So John gives a revelation about their determination. He tells us here in verse 17, 18 the reasons for their determination. Two things they reasoned. Here's why they got mad at him. Number one, they thought, they believed he broke the commandment of God. Verse 18 says that. Uh, because he not only broke the Sabbath. You see that? John's not stating that he broke the Sabbath. Jesus never sinned, amen. But they believed that he broke the Sabbath. They were convinced that he broke the Sabbath. And they were determined to kill him. You can be determined, and determination is good when it's in the right things and for the right one and in the right way. We need to have some spiritual backbone and determination to stand for Jesus and live for him. But you can also be convinced of something and be like these religious rulers and be convinced and be deceived in your conviction. Listen to this. We better make sure our convictions are based on and consistent with all of Scripture. Amen. They believed, number one, he broke the commandment of God. Number two, they believed that he blasphemed because of his connection with God. Verse 18 again says, but, uh, but also said that God was his father making himself equal with God. So the religious leaders wanted Jesus killed because Jesus said that God was his father. <laughs> I mean, they believed that Jesus had blasphemed. They, he made himself equal with God. They understood the impl implications of our Lord's statement. John explains Jesus was making himself equal with God. And listen, the Jews, they got something right. They got a lot wrong. These Jewish leaders had a lot wrong. But they got this right. They concluded rightly that Jesus made himself equal with God because he is God. The Father was working and the Son was working too. What was good for the Father was good for the Son. John, John Brown said, all is of the Father, all is by the Son. Did the Father create the universe? So did the Son. Does the Father uphold the universe? So does the Son. Does the Father govern the universe? So does the Son. Uh, is the Father the Savior of the world? So is the Son. Surely the Jews did not err when they concluded that our Lord made himself equal with God. Surely he who is so intimately connected with God that he does what God does, does all God does, does all in the same manner in which God does it, surely such a person cannot be but be equal with God. End of quote. That's who our Lord is. <laughs> so the persecution of Jesus was officially launched. Uh, the, campaign, the campaign against Jesus was officially underway. The attacks on Jesus was officially endorsed by the religious leaders. The quest to kill the Son of God was officially sanctioned by the hard-headed, hard-hearted religious leaders. The Bible tells us about the persecution of Jesus. It was turned on. We read, as we go through the rest of the Gospel of John, Lord willing, we're going to see that it gets turned up. So there's the persecution of Jesus. Number two, I want to point out in your outline today, not only the persecution of Jesus, uh, the proclamation by Jesus. Verse 19 through 23 gives us the proclamation by Jesus. Four areas he makes a proclamation on. First of all, don't you notice his perception of God? He makes a proclamation about his perception of God. Verse 19, he gives an answer to these Jews. He answers them and he gives them assurance. Look in verse 19 again. Then Jesus answered and said to them. I love that. Our Lord Jesus wasn't a coward. Amen. <laughs> He didn't talk about them behind their back, but he went and told them what he said to them. They got it first-hand knowledge from Jesus. <laughs> Amen. He, the Lord Jesus was bold and clear and straightforward in his response to those who sought to kill him. 
He gives them assurance. He said, most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of Himself. Most assuredly, truly, truly, verily, verily, listen to this. This is the truth. You better get it. That's what He's saying to them. Jesus didn't say that He wouldn't do nothing, but He said He couldn't do anything apart from the Father. The Son did not act independently of the Father. He and the Father were so connected that they worked together in perfect harmony for the glory of God. Jesus is not confessing here that He was impotent in His ability, but He was teaching them that it wasn't just the Son doing the work, but it was the Father doing the work and the Son doing the work together. The Lord had already healed this man that was laid sick for 38 years. Nobody could help him. Those Jewish leaders couldn't help him. They, there was people all around that pool. And week in and week out, day in and day out, those religious leaders didn't have the power to help them do anything. They couldn't heal the sick, couldn't cleanse the leper, they couldn't raise up the paralyzed, they couldn't touch the deaf, and they could not uh, touch the blind. They didn't have any power to do it. But Jesus demonstrated his uh, power by raising this man up. But Jesus was telling the rulers that the Father worked on the Sabbath and the Son was working too. He didn't break the Sabbath day and God was not guilty of breaking the Sabbath day. Listen to this. The miracle of the healed man and the message from the healer should have awakened them to the fact that the Messiah was in their midst and that God was working amongst them. But they didn't. They were hard-headed, hard-hearted. They missed God. Jesus tells us in verse 19, he gives a word about the, the seeing of our Lord. He said, but what he sees the Father do. The Lord Jesus was doing the works of God, and that truth was rejected by the religious Jews. For Jesus to see what the Father was doing speaks of his, speaks of his uh, intimate knowledge, his omniscience. And his deity. He's seeing what the Father was doing. The leaders understood Jesus was claiming to be the work, do the work of God just as the Father was doing it. So the Lord was so in tune with the Father that he heard from the Father and he saw the Father and he worked with the Father. <laughs> Amen. And the Bible tells us in verse 19 about the servant of our Lord. He said, for whatever, Jesus said, for whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. So the Lord saw the Father work and whatever the Father did, the Son did as well. The Lord Jesus was serving on the Sabbath day because God was serving on the Sabbath day. The Lord Jesus had showed mercy on the Sabbath day because God the Father was showing mercy on the Sabbath day. The Lord showed compassion on this, uh, he, this uh, man that had been paralyzed for 38 years on the Sabbath day because God had compassion on that man on the Sabbath day. The Father and the Son was in unison in all things. They were so connected. The Son was in no way ever, no shape, form, or fashion ever in rebellion to His Father in heaven. I wish I could say that about my kids. Can I tell you, I wish I could say that about me to my parents. I wish I could say that about you to your parents. But we ain't always been that way, amen? We ain't done our mom and daddy's will completely and perfectly always. We failed miserably. Our kids fail miserably. Their kids are going to fail miserably. We get to laugh at them like they did us, amen, grandparents? <laughs> Matt Carter said this, let me put that in our modern vernacular. Jesus isn't a trust fund kid trying to distance himself from his father. He's not the black sheep trying to make a name for himself. He's not the top A firstborn trying to outdo his dad and make it on his own. He's perfectly in sync with his father. He's not a second God come to steal the worship and adoration that belongs only to the true God. He is the true God. And he and the father are one. To worship God is to worship Jesus. And to worship Jesus is to worship God. Hallelujah. Amen to that. Jesus reveals his perception. B, don't you see, uh, the passion of God. He makes a proclamation about the passion of God. Notice what he says in verse 20. For the Father loves the Son. The Father loves the Son. That word, that verb translated love there is not the word agape, but it's uh, the love of will and choice, but it is the word phileo. Uh, the love of deep feelings, the warmth of an affection that the Father feels for his Son. 
This is the only time in the New Testament that this is used in reference to the Father's love for the Son of God. It's a present tense verb in the Greek language which indicates an eternally uninterrupted and all-knowing love that leaves no room for ignorance, uh, making it impossible for Jesus to have been unaware of God's will about anything, about the Sabbath or anything else. Jesus, Jesus was not left out in the cold. He knew God's will perfectly about everything. For God, he said, for the Father loves the Son. God's love for the Son was real, fully realized and fully impactful in the earthly life and ministry of our Lord Jesus. Even as believers, we cannot fully grasp that type of love. And we know God loves us like nobody else loves us. I understand that. But listen, we can't, all, we can't get it like Jesus got it in the sense that he was sinless. Because we're sinners saved by the grace of God. There are times that we don't feel loved. Amen. <laughs> There are times that we don't sense God's presence, even though He's never forsaken us, never left us nor forsaken us. We don't always sense His presence. There are times that we are not certain of direction to go and steps to take. It wasn't like that for Jesus. He knew perfectly, not 99% of the time, not 99% of God's will. He knew it all perfectly, all the time. Lord Jesus didn't have that problem. Father's love for the Son was never hindered in any way. Notice he gives a word about the demonstration of the Father's love. How does he love us? He said, and shows him all things that he does. Uh, John gives here a revelation about the Father's work, love. The Father works are revealed to Jesus. He said, and he shows him all things that he does. He loves the Son and shows him. The Son had full access to the work and the will of the Father, to the plans and the prerogatives of the Father, to the presence and the power of the Father. John tells us that the Father's works were revealed to Jesus. The Father showed the Son how many things? The Bible says all things. All things that God the Father was doing, God the Son was doing. Jesus is the unique and only begotten Son of God. He is God manifested in the flesh, therefore he always was about the Father's work. Though, he was, though Jesus was fully man as he was on this earth, he was also fully God. And, and we, know, uh, we know that by faith and trust in what the Word of God teaches. The Father's works were revealed to the Son. The Father's works were revealed through the Son. Verse 20 again says this, And he will show him greater works than these. Now he's talking to these people who were persecuting him that wanted him dead. Jesus didn't cower down before the godless religious leaders and apologize for works of mercy done on the Sabbath day. Amen. On the contrary, the Lord Jesus declared the Father's work. He would show him greater works. The Father has worked through the Son, and the Father will continue to work through the Son. God had shown him, and J Jesus demonstrated those works on earth. And God would show him, he tells them, greater works than these. <laughs> Jesus revealed to the rulers that they, what they had seen and heard about was not an end. Uh, but there would be much more from where they come from. He tells them about the result. He said that you might marvel. That you may marvel. Those who are in opposition and disbelief, that you might marvel. Now they weren't marveling at that time. Matter of fact, they were mad. They were mad because the Sabbath they had been broke. So Jesus was said there's coming a time and works that are coming that will cause them to marvel. The Greek word thumadzo uh, means to wonder, uh, the marvel at. To have in admiration. Jesus said that they will see the work of God and cause many to wonder. They'd be in awe of God's work with their eyes. It's something they've never seen before. The works of the Lord should cause us to marvel. But if we're hardened by like these religious rulers, we can miss God. We can, get, we can miss God's work in our midst. Jesus makes a proclamation. We've seen the, his perception of God. He made a proclamation about the passion of God. Number three, he makes a proclamation about his power from God. Verse 21 and 22, y'all hang with me. This is good stuff. I don't know if y'all are trekking with me. I'm trekking. I'm trying to preach as hard as I can. He talks about the power of the Son. Look in verse 21. Verse 21 says, For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. I mean, he gives an illustration about the Father's power here. The Father has power to raise the dead and give life to them. Now, they didn't have a New Testament. I mean, Jesus hadn't raised Lazarus yet from the dead. He hadn't raised the widow from Nain's son from the dead yet. They, but I'm telling you, they believed their Old Testament. The Jews knew that God had power to raise the dead. God had raised the dead in the past. He raised, he raised the dead in the past through his prophets. Elijah, 
at least on a couple of different occasions, uh, the prophet Elijah uh, raised the son of the widow of Zarephath in 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 22. And the prophet Elisha, in the case of the Shunammite's son, in 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 32 through 35. And then later on, uh, over in 2 Kings chapter 13, verse 21, the Bible says that these men were, uh, were the Jews were, uh, Israelites were burying uh, this man. And a band of raiders came in. They saw him coming, so they had to make haste. They couldn't give the man a proper burial. And he th they threw the body in the cave of Elisha. The prophet Elisha had died at that time. He was buried, and his skeleton just remained, his bones. Well, the dead man they threw in the cave touched the bones of Elisha, and God raised the man back to life there in the cave. He raised him up. Hallelujah. So God raised the dead in the Old Testament. And he said, just as the Father raises uh, the dead and gives life to them, then he tells us, even so, in the same manner, the Son gives life to whom he will. Just as the Father has power to raise the dead and give life to them, in the same way the Son has power to raise the dead and give life to them. The Lord's word should have registered with these rulers about the importance of the Son of God. The Son gives life to whom he will. This again affirms the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Only God is the life giver. Amen. And Jesus, the Son, gives life, so that means that Jesus is God. Jesus gives a word about the power of the sun. Now, the sun in the sky may light the planet, may heat the planet. It may drive our weather patterns, but the Son of God is all-powerful. That sun in the sky is not all-powerful, but the sun on the throne is. He is the life giver, and he has power to raise the dead. That's encouraging for dead people. Amen. Uh, that's encouraging for dead hopes. And that's encouraging for dead marriages. That's encouraging me to dead churches. God has the power to raise life again. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. The Bible tells us about the power of the Son. Then Jesus in verse 22 will tell us about the position of the Son. Uh, I'm not talking about the position of the Son in the sky. I'm talking about the position of the Son on the throne. He says, For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. So Jesus is transparent about the Father's judgment. In essence, he's letting these Jews know that in opposing him, they're opposing God. In resisting him, they're resisting God. He has power to raise the dead. Then he speaks of his position as judge as well. He makes a major, stu major statement about the judge and the judgment. The Father judges no one. That doesn't mean there will be no judgment. Let me remind you, the Old Testament reveals often that God would judge the wicked. Uh, God, the book of Jonah is a warning to the people of Nineveh that if they didn't repent, that God was going to judge them. Was, and then uh, the book of Psalms is full of warnings about the judgment of God on wicked nations, on people. The Israelites were, were, were cast into to, uh, exile because they were judged. They were, uh, in, in the Old Testament, when they rebelled against God, the earth opened up, swallowed up those unbelievers. Those who died in the wilderness died because they lacked faith in God. They were displeasing to God. The cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were judged because of godliness, godlessness. So judgment will happen. But Jesus further details the importance of the Son by sharing with his adversaries that he will be the judge. He said, but has committed, God the Father, for the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. The word committed there means to give, to bestow upon. Uh, to put. The Father has given the judgment over to the Son of God. He's committed all judgment, bestowed the right to judge all judgment to the Son of God. Glenn Spencer in his commentary, great preacher, Glenn Spencer said, Men walk and scorn him now, but the day is coming when the Lord Jesus Christ will sit in judgment of the lost. At that time they will acknowledge him as God, but it will be too late. Tragically, the opportunity for redemption will be over, and the time of retribution will be at hand. End of quote. When the Apostle Paul was on mission for God, spreading the gospel out through the continents, he came to Greece and to Athens to, to a pagan people that worshipped many gods. Kind of like America. Like him coming in modern day America. He came there and he found an altar that was to the unknown God. 
And Paul said, this God that you don't know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to introduce you to him. He's the real and true God. He's the one and only God. So he talked to them about creation, about the creator. He talked to them about redemption. He talked to them about the resurrection, about the judge and the judgment. In Acts chapter 17, verse 31, listen to what Paul writes about Jesus. He said, because he, God the Father, has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Who's he talking about there? He's talking about the Son of God, Jesus Christ. The fact is that everyone from every nation of all time will stand before Jesus and give an account to God on that day. Are you ready to meet Jesus? Are you ready for the coming of our Lord Jesus? Are you ready for your appearing before Jesus? You and I have a date with deity. You're going to stand before God one day. If you're lost, you're going to stand before him in the, at the great white throne of judgment before you're cast into the lake of fire. If you're saved, you're going to stand before him at the beam of seat of Christ where we will be judged on what we've done as Christians. We're going to be judged. The salvation, we're saved. We're going to be saved, but we're going to, be we're going to stand before the judge one day. Are you ready? The Bible speaks about his perception of God, the passion of God, his power from God. Fourthly and lastly, Jesus makes a proclamation about the purpose of God in verse 23. And notice the intent he gives, the intent of the Father in verse 23. What is God's intention in all of this? He says that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. That's God's intention. The, the, the Father's intent for the incarnation and the coming, the, uh, committing the judgment to the Son is that all should honor Jesus as they honor the Father. The Father is glorified when the the sun is high and lifted up. When we deny Jesus, we're denying God. Albert Barnes said, If our Savior here did not intend to teach that he ought to be worshipped and to be esteemed as equal with God, it would be difficult to teach it by any language which we could use. <laughs> Amen. That's what he meant. The Father intends for the Son to be honored, worshipped, and praised. The word honored there in verse 23 from the Greek word that means to prize, to revere, to value. He's to be above all things. We're to value Jesus. J.C. Ryle in his commentary on John said, And now let us think whether it is possible to make too much of Christ in our religion. If we have ever thought so, let us cast aside the thought forever, both in this his own nature as God and in his office as commissioned mediator. He is worthy of all honor. He that is with one with the Father, the giver of life, the King of kings, the coming judge can never be too much exalted. Amen. He can never be. We can never praise him enough. Hey, quit, quit all that praying to Jesus and praising Jesus. Stop it now. That's godless. I'm telling you, you, you don't honor Jesus. You're not honoring the Father. If you have trouble speaking the name of Jesus, if you have trouble lifting up praise to Jesus, if you have trouble in rejoicing in the Word of God, if you are ashamed of the work of Jesus, then you're not right with God. Amen, preacher. When, when we honor the Son, we honor the Father. It is God's intent that all should honor the Son. And He will be, and He is being honored through His people, His believers, true believers, those who have been born again. They are honoring to the Son of God. And they're, therefore, they're honoring to God. There's going to come a day. He will be honored in this life through believers, but there will come a day that He'll be honored after life at the throne by the rest of people. So the Bible tells us about the intent of the Father. Lastly, I started my message out with the title of my sermon, uh, The Importance of the Son. Jesus, in the last part of verse 23, just hammers home this point, the importance of the Son of God. He says, He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent Him. Wow. He who does not honor the Son of God in our lives, with our lips, in our labors. Jesus tells these Jews who had dishonored him and sought to destroy him the truth about him. They need to hear. And by the way, Jesus loved his enemies. He was trying to tell them the truth so they'd be saved because he knows what eternal destruction is. He knows what the lake of fire is all about. This goes for anyone and everyone who will dishonor the Son of God. Those who do not honor the Son of God do not honor the Father who sent him. 
God sent Jesus. He was on mission. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. So let me tell you today, the Son of God is all important. He's all important, church. Uh, we cannot get to God apart from Jesus. We cannot know God apart from Jesus. We cannot pray to God apart from Jesus. We cannot approach God apart from Jesus. We cannot serve God apart from Jesus. We cannot please God apart from Jesus. I can't preach to God and please God in the preaching of the Word of God if I don't preach about Jesus. <laughs> I'm closing, but let me finish this. Oliver B. Green had a good word. I'm closing. Oliver B. Green, in his commentary on John, said this, The only way to please God the Father is to honor Jesus the Son. Yes, even as we honor God the Father, the Son is to be worshipped as we worship the Father. For there is no inferiority in the Son. He is equal with the Father in dignity and in authority. Those who refuse to honor the Son thereby dishonor God the Father who sent Him into the world. So let me ask you today. Let's get down where we are today. Are, are you minimizing the Son of God in your life, in your home, in your marriage, in any way? Or have you dishonored Him in every way? Do you honor the Son of God in your life and in your living? Do you surrender to Jesus, love Jesus, and serve Jesus, and let Him love others through you? Do you worship and praise Jesus? Are you relying on anything or anyone else beside Jesus? The Son of God is all important. I'm going to invite you today to come to Him and to trust in Him. I want to invite you today to live for Him and give Him your life today and give Him glory today. Are you guilty of opposing the Son of God in His work in the world? Are you guilty of opposing the Son of God in your life? Repent today. Turn to Him today. Believe on the Lord Jesus and be saved today. Trust in Him today. Believe on the Lord Jesus and rejoice in His work and serve Him today. The Father's at work and so is the Son. So if the Son's at work and we're followers of Jesus, we're going to be serving Jesus. Amen? We're going to be doing good. We're going to be showing mercy. We're going to be showing compassion. Let's learn from those religious leaders not to do what they did. Let's learn from them. Jesus loved them, but they sought to kill him. Jesus came to die for them, and they would, ultimately they would hand him over to death. And he did die. Thank God he didn't stay dead. Amen. On the third day, Jesus not only has power to raise the dead and give life to others, he has the power to raise himself, and he did. And God raised the Son up, and God the Father doing the same work. The Son did what the, fa he showed the, fa the Father showed him to do. And let's continue to do what Jesus has showed us to do and led us to do. Let's stay faithful to the Word of God. Let's remember that He's all important, the importance of the Son. Father, thank You for Your Word today. Lord, I pray that Your Word will not return into You void today. Lord, let it accomplish what You please in hearts and minds today. Lord, break down strongholds that we built up that maybe this religious tradition or legalistic tradition. Lord, I pray that you would show us the truth today, that we'd walk in fellowship with Jesus today, that we'd serve in the power of the Spirit today. God, do a work in this place today. I pray for brothers and sisters in the Lord today, that we'd give you all the worship, all the glory, all the praise, that we'd never be ashamed of Jesus. Oh, God, let us lift up Jesus in our homes, on our jobs, in the world. Lord, in your church, in our classes as we teach. And uh, with our neighbors as we share, Lord, as we give, as we serve, let it be all about Jesus. Lord, draw people to yourself in this invitation today. Lord, that we might surrender afresh and anew to you today. Lord, if there's any in this place today that's lost, today would be the day of salvation. That they would come to Jesus. They would not try to come to God apart from Jesus. They would not try to come to God and please God in any other way, but they would come to Jesus and cast themselves on Jesus today. Lord, save the lost in this place, Lord. Renew our minds. Strengthen us in our faith today. And draw people to yourself in this invitation time. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me?